Hello there and welcome to part 17 of uh, Julian Huxley's Essays in Popular Science and Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World. It's either 17 or 16 because I get the numbers mixed up, um, but that doesn't matter. So in the last video I was mentioning about um, the whitewashing history and um, I mentioned 1984, George Orwell's 1984, George Orwell knew Aldous Huxley um, they were both Englishmen and they were both members of something called the Fabian Society, which is a secret society, well, not secret, but it's a, well, kind of a private society. Um, it's known about, just like Freemasonry, but I mean, um, when you remember there, uh, apparently um, you get told information uh, that's going to happen in the future. And uh, this is what I've heard and I believe this. This is why I believe that... Uh, Things that are in 1984 have come to pass, obviously with CCTV cameras, etc. Uh, and things have come to pass, to to pass in, um, you know, a brave new world. What with um, one of the things that um, Aldous Huxley talk about is the perfect kind of uh, form of of medication that would make people happy all the time without the side effects of um, alcohol and, and and other recreational drugs. And we're kind of halfway, well, we could argue that we're halfway there, but, you know, we've had Big Pharma, haven't we, giving us antidepressants and things like that. Um, so there's a connection there, as well as many other things, the breakup of the family unit that we're seeing now with divorce, and what goes into this and more. So, uh, so again, 1984, thought I'd bring that up there. Uh, and here they're just talking about, yeah, the, the whitewashing of history, you know. So it says here there were some things called pyramids, for example, no one's heard of them anymore, and a man called Shakespeare. Um, you, you've never heard of them, of course, this this uh, director's saying. <coughs> uh, Such are the advantages of a, of a really scientific education, he's saying. <laughs> you know, um, mentions here the introduction of a first Ford T model. Uh, and I said I was going to talk about that, um, about Ford, um, how it represents the, uh, you know, the scientific um, control of, of a brave new world, the new new world order, is what, what I call it. Because um, I was to we're talking about here the the breaking the breaking up of the family. Well, they're talking about the past, aren't they? How the family family no longer exists and things like that. Um, previously to. Um, what I was just talking about, and I thought before I forget, we'll bring in just a little bit of Desmond Morris's work, um, and I photocopied a little little bits that I think are relevant. I think it's either from the Human Zoo or the Naked Ape, one of the one of the two, because they're both both very similar. Because um, he talks about um, this process that we go through um, when we select a mate to start a family with. Um, that's just essential to it, to to um, how we do things. Um, here I've underlined it. Um, pair formation sex is calling it, um, and it says here the human animal is basically and um, biologically a pair forming species. As the emotional relationship develops between a pair of potential mates, it is aided and abetted by the sexual activities they share. The pair formation function of sexual behaviour is so important to for our species that nowhere outside the pairing phrase do sexual activities regularly reach such a high intensity. <coughs> it is this function that causes so much trouble when it clashes with the various non-productive forms of sex. Even if pro procreation sex is, is successfully avoided and no fertilisation takes place, a pair bond may still automatically start to form when none is intended. It is because of this that casual copulations fr frequently create so many problems. And um, this is what they were talking about in A Brave New World. There are, everything is a casual, um, um, you know, relationship. There are no real relationships. Um, and he's saying the strength of the pair bond here is, is, is so um, ingrained in her um, behaviour, you know. And... It reminds me of what I was just reading about that chap who was basically uh, thinking inside his head about how, um, you know, 
they were talking about this girl he had feelings for as if, as if she were a piece of meat and how he wanted to you know punch them and all of that because he's jealous and he's angry and he's because he um he's, he wants he wants um he feels that you know she's his basically um this is this is natural this is part of this pair bonding process um yeah, reading on on this, if a copulator has had his or her pair-forming mechanism damaged in some way during childhood, right on par with what we're looking at, so that he or she is incapable of falling in love, uh, romance, you know, uh, or if there is a temporary and deliberate suppression of the pair-bonding urge, then a casual copulation may succeed and be enjoyed without any later repercussions exactly what we're looking at here but it takes two to copulate and the partner sorry but it takes two to copulate and the partner in such an encounter may not be so lucky if his or her pair bonding mechanism is more active a one-sided pair bond may start to form as a result of the emotional intensity of the sexual actions the inevitable outcome is that this of this is that society becomes littered with broken hearts, hang-ups and abandoned lovers who substitutely find it extremely difficult to form a new pair bond with a fresh partner. Only when the pair bonding mechanism has been equally, equally damaged or is equally suppressed in both partners can a casual human copulation be performed without undue risk. And this is precisely what we've, what we've been looking at and discussing here in the Brave New World. Um, and interestingly, the chap that um, <coughs> I was referring to was jealous because he had feelings for this girl. I think the girl was kind of confused if she had feelings for him. So it could have been a one-way process. He had feelings for her. <coughs> Excuse me. But she didn't have feelings for him. Or maybe he was a bit confused and he was more certain. So again, that's right on with what um, I've just read there. <clears throat> uh, reading on, even then, there is always the danger that the strength of the sexual response of one partner may be such that for him or her, it will start to repair the bondage damage or uh, disinhibit the bondage urge. Yeah, so... You've got um, here pair formation sex. This is what I was uh, the, the section I was reading, and here it reads pair maintenance sex. So once a pair bond has been ses successfully formed, sexual activity still function to maintain and reinforce the bond. So again, you know that sex is you know it's not it's. Obviously, for procreation, but the sex itself, the intimacy, it reinforces the bond. Um, he mentions here about um, uh, lovers going for, with, with, you know, being apart, going for long periods without being intimate with one another, uh, like in war and things like that. Uh, it says that when they are reunited, there is a typ typically a um, resur resurgence of high sexual intensity on the first nights they are together again. As I go through a minor rebonding process, and it's almost like you think of those 1940s uh, war films, you know, oh darling, will I see you again, and all that, and the romance, it's, it's that kind of thing, all about the pair bonding again, that uh, Aldous Huxley and uh, the characters in there so detest. Um, so you've got pair maintenance sex. Um, after after pair formation sex, and then there's the the process of um, you know uh, forming that you know finding a person. Um, so it says these first three categories he's talking about: procreation, pair formation, and pair maintenance sex. Those are the three orders: procreation, pair formation, and pair maintenance sex. Together make up the primary reproductive functions of human sexual behaviour. <coughs> yeah, um, and I'm sort of going to mention here, it says, uh, it says before moving on, on this, it says, 
in individuals whose pair bonding mechanism has run into some sort of trouble, have occasionally found it convenient to argue that there is no such thing as a biological pairing urge in the human species. Romantic love, as they prefer to call it, is looked upon as a recent and highly artificial... Um, yeah, it's, it's, looked at, it's looked upon as recent and highly artificial, um, which is the sort of thing they would... Um, well, they were making out that this... Um, process, you know, in the past was disgusting and kind of, <coughs> you know, they were looking at it as artificial, weren't they, you know. Um, and moving on here, I think this is um, a good bit, juicy bit here. It says here, the greatest sexual uh, complication to arise has been the clash between the primary reproductive categories, procreation, pair formation and pair maintenance sex. On the one hand, and the primary non reproductive categories, on the other hand, in the pre pill days when con contraception was forbidden, rare or inefficient, procreation sex provided a major hazard for explore, exploration, exploratory sex, self rewarding sex, and the rest. Even in the so called post pill paradise, which some have seen as <coughs> heralding an epoch. epoch of wild promiscuity, the problem is far from solved because of the persistence of the fundamental pair bonding properties of human sexual encounters. Widespread, trouble free pros promiscuity excuse me, is a myth and it will always will be. It is a myth born on the, of the wishful thinking of status sex, but it will forever remain a wishful thought. Man's strong pair bond, man's strong pair forming urge, stemming, in evolutionary terms, from his greatly increased parental duties, will persist no matter what technical advances are achieved with perfect contraception in the years to come. Uh, he sounds quite confident on that, but I don't think Julian Huxley and his brother um, sound confident that this is going to be maintained. I think you know. With the uh, genetic manipulation, they want to stamp this out, don't they? Uh, but he does say here there's going to be a, uh, you know, the demands of the pair bond. He says equally there can be no doubt that this will intensify the clash between these forms of sex and the demands of the pair bond. Unhappily, as a result, the children will suffer along with their sexually confused parents. Okay, so saying that there's you know going to be some problem, but here. I've underlined this, it reads, As it is, it seems as if a basic animal nature will always stand in the way of this development, or will at least discourage it, until such a time as we have undergone some radical genetic change. Well, <laughs> this is the change we've been discussing, right? Radical genetic change. Well, <clears throat> with sex, the one trick is more difficult to accomplish, and society is littered with the bitter, jealous, forlorn heartbreaks, miserable, shattered families, and wanted offspring to prove it. Sounds like Julian Huxley there, doesn't it? Uh, really, no wonder sex has become a problem. But um, very, very um, uh, appropriate to bring him up because of all the pair bonding thing. Um, so that's Desmond Morris there. And I'm going to stop here because I'm running out of time. I'll talk to you in part 18.